You're tuned in to Getting to the Root of It, focusing on healing and letting go of the wounds of addiction and other unresolved traumas of the past. Your breakthrough begins with you. Are you ready to change your life? Stay tuned as your host, expert therapist, personal development coach, and spiritual cheerleader, Natasha Khan inspires you to live the life you were destined to live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Getting to the Root of It with your host, Natasha Khan. Today, I wanted to have a conversation with you about addiction. For many years, it was a controversial conversation. And over time, for many, we are discovering that at least one family member and or friend is impacted by the comorbidity of this illness. For many years, and still today, some people believe that addiction is a choice. Some believe it's a moral issue. But I have learned in my own journey battling addiction that it is a disease. And the best way that I've learned to have a greater understanding of it is breaking up the word disease into two parts and viewing it as a disease of the mind. This disease or disease of the mind is a comorbid illness. And by comorbidity, I mean that it can be two disorders occurring at the same time. For instance, you can have a medical condition and a psychiatric disorder. In this particular case, it's with addiction, it is mental health and substance use, which can either occur simultaneously or one right after the other. As I was getting to understand my own illness and understand the addiction issues that I endured throughout my journey, I came to realize that a lot of my issues and our dependency, whether it was to drugs or alcohol, work, sex, toxic relationships, and or codependent relationships, had a lot of different contributing factors. Earlier on in school and in my education, I learned of the biological, psychological, social, spiritual model of addiction. And what it explains is the varying contributing factors that play a part and increases our predisposition and or risk for dependency issues in early adulthood. There are some instances where children are born into drugs and alcohol and may suffer with and or struggle with substance abuse issues, which will then morph into developing mental health issues. But for the majority of the people that I'm speaking with today, what we have lack of knowledge on or maybe fail to realize is that many of us have mental health issues that have contributed to and impacted the development of substance abuse issues along the way. So today I wanted to take a look at the different varying factors of the disease model of addiction to help give you some insight into what some of the risk factors are. Biologically, what puts us at a predisposition for dependency issues of any kind are our genetics, our gender, our ethnicity, stages of development, chemical imbalance, and or neurotransmitter imbalances. One of the reasons why addiction is no one's fault and no one is to be blamed is because we have no control over the biological aspect of development. We have no control over our genetics our gender, our ethnicity, and or the chemical or neurotransmitter imbalances in the brain. As a result, those biological factors can then increase the risk of psychological issues such as depression, anxiety, ADD or ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder, cognitive vulnerabilities, history of trauma, stress history, lacking coping skills to manage strong or unwanted overwhelming emotions. These psychological issues coupled with our biological issues do have a significant impact on the stages of our development from the time that we are born. 
The environmental factors include, but are not limited to, our family upbringing, cultural norms and beliefs, generational beliefs, and our understanding of self and society, influences from our community, from our friends, school, even our society today, and what we see in social media, are just some of the examples of the varying factors that have an influence and an impact on the emotional disconnection that we experience, whether it occurred from the time we were born or somewhere along the line of our stages of development. I tend to focus a lot on stages of development and family upbringing. Not to place blame, not to say that anyone was right or wrong, but to understand that while we don't have control of the biological contributing factors and or the psychological issues that may have developed in early childhood, how we are nurtured, how we develop, and people, places, and things have a significant impact and influence on our mind. What we believe to be true, which drives how we feel, and without healthy coping skills and learning on how to identify emotion or express our emotions in a healthy way, will then drive unhealthy behaviors. So when working with families that struggle with addiction or have been impacted by addiction, it is super important for families to understand that your loved one's illness and or your illness that you may be enduring is no one's fault. No one chose to be a workaholic or a codependent or a drug addict and or alcoholic. No one chooses to be depressed and or anxious. There are certain varying factors, as I mentioned earlier, that play a huge part in the way the brain is developed. So for many families that are listening today, I hope that we can learn together that this illness can go into remission. Like cancer, there is no cure, but there are a series of things that can be done that can help put it into remission, i.e. also known as recovery. We can experience recovery from this mental illness, but it takes a lot of work, not just from the individual that is experiencing the dependency issues, but the environment in which they are living in can also be beneficial, helpful, and supportive as a result. It is known that addiction is a family illness. And many of my families will say to me, well, I don't have an addiction. My loved one suffers with drugs and alcohol. And I'm the first to say that just because you're not a drug addict and an alcoholic, doesn't mean that you don't suffer with dependency issues. Many of our families that are or have been impacted by addiction experience codependency or have codependent relationships. Many suffer with depression and or anxiety and or have engaged in toxic relationships and or workaholics themselves. Many use food as a way to comfort themselves or to manage or to cope with their own emotional struggle and or suffering. So I hope today that when you're listening to this, that you come with an open mind and understand that we all have hurts and hangups. And my goal, my dream, my passion is to remove the stigma behind addiction and not just see it as a moral issue or a choice or that you have to be a drug addict and or alcoholic to have a problem. For many of us, including myself, prior to engaging in the use of mind and mood altering substances, my dependency issues stemmed or started way before my using. I started using at age 17 or 18 years old. Prior to that, I experienced physical abuse, verbal and psychological abuse, along with sexual assault by the time I was 14 years old. Now, keeping in mind when I mentioned earlier that stage of development is a contributing factor, 
someone experiences trauma or is experiencing depression or anxiety at an early age, based on their experiences, the individual draws a conclusion, depending upon what age they are and what stage of development that they're in, will draw their own conclusion of their experience. As a result of lack of understanding, breakdown in communication within family dynamics, children will naturally develop their own perception of an experience if they're not explained or don't have a clear understanding of what's really occurring in that particular event and or experience in their lives. For instance, a child experiences a mother and father fighting and or going through a divorce. If the child does not understand why mom and dad are fighting or why they're getting a divorce, the child most oftentimes will interpret or perceive that the divorce or the problems between mom and dad are directly in correlation to something that has to do with the child. Maybe the child is questioning their worth. Are they the problem or are they the reason why mom and dad are fighting or why mom and dad are getting a divorce? And if the child does not have all of the facts, have all of the information or clearly understands what's happening in that particular experience and or event, the child will draw their own conclusion and or perception of what they believe to be true. This begins to shape and influence core beliefs, such as, it's my fault, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not deserving, or may even ask the question, what is wrong with me? And these belief systems begin to take root in the core of an individual. And as it takes root, the child begins to experience emotions associated with what they believe to be true from their perception. Now let's keep in mind someone's perception is their perception. They have a right to have their own perception, but that doesn't mean that their perception is reality. And most oftentimes in our families, other family members are quick to dismiss someone's perception and or opinion of an experience because they may not have experienced or perceived the event the same way the other party did. And hopefully I'm not confusing you too much, but understanding that two people sharing the same experience, but depending upon their family history, depending upon their psychological issues, depending upon the stage of development, both individuals will walk away with a very distinct and or unique perception of the experience. That doesn't make either person right or wrong or good or bad. It's just how they've interpreted what they've experienced. So as we move back and look at the person that's struggling with these dependency issues, what they believe to be true then makes them feel a certain type of way. And if they lack healthy coping strategies or healthy coping skills, or maybe they learned at a very young age that we don't talk about emotions, or other family members growing up didn't express emotion, or they learned to believe that emotion was insignificant. You know, most oftentimes I hear a lot of young men and women that come into therapy saying, well, I was told that crying is for the weak. Being vulnerable is for the weak. And sometimes all they know to do in terms of emotion is either to be angry or to be happy and there's sort of, there's no in-between. So for many children, they grow up having and experiencing emotion, but not really knowing what to do with the emotion. So that emotion begins to build up and they begin to harbor emotion. And what many of us may or may not understand or know when it comes to emotion is that even though we are not thinking cognitively on a conscious level about how we're feeling, it is then stored in our subconscious. Think of it almost as a second layer within our mind where those emotions are buried, where those emotions are stored. I refer to it as the infinite box of emotion. This infinite box has no measurement. There's no measurement of how wide. There's no measurement of how tall. It's just this space, this open space that every time we experience an emotion and we don't know how to 
manage the emotion, we store it into this infinite box. Now think about our development from early childhood, depending upon who you are and what you've experienced, the perceptions that you may have developed over time and how you feel are all stored away. Well, I use the description of a sponge. You can only soak a sponge with water long enough where it will hold water for a period of time. But at some point, if you keep pouring water onto the sponge and you don't squeeze out the sponge, it begins to leak water. I use our emotions as the same thing. Our brain can only absorb so much emotion. And at some point, if there's not a release to release the emotions that you've been holding onto, there comes a point when your emotions will contribute to emotional stress and it will manifest itself in many different ways. Whether that's through anxiety, whether that's through depression, whether that's through the need to control, being obsessive, being compulsive. So there's a lot of different things that can happen as a result of harboring these emotions. And most oftentimes you'll see that a lot in teenagers where many have it to say that they're being re rebellious or they're not behaving appropriately or maybe they're being withdrawn or maybe they're shy and they keep to themselves and they don't really socialize. And I've discovered as a society that we struggle in focusing more on how someone's behaving rather than taking the time to understand what's really going on emotionally with the individual. And then to take it one step further, why do they feel that way? What do they believe to be true? What is the mindset? Because if I believe based on a particular experience that I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough, or I'm not deserving of good things, that's going to lead me to feel unworthy. That's going to make me feel sad. That's going to make me feel shame. I may even feel scared. Over time, I can feel hopeless and helpless. And as a result of how I'm feeling, if I don't have healthy coping mechanisms and healthy coping skills to manage those emotions, I'm going to start to behave a particular way. For me, I needed to be center of attention. I was, as a result of what I had been through, I was very emotionally vulnerable and emotionally needy. And so I discovered at a very early age, way before I started using drugs and alcohol, that I wanted to feel loved. I wanted to feel important. I wanted to believe that I mattered. So I was very much a people pleaser. I would do and conform to whomever I was with because I believe that if I made them happy, then I would be happy. If I can get them to like me, then I would be likable and I would be okay. And this started at a very young age, started probably in elementary school. And the more that I endured some form of trauma throughout my life, it's the more that it drove me to want to be a people pleaser because I also learned growing up in my household with my mom and with the abuse that I endured, that if I was the perfect little girl and if I did everything right and if I did everything that was pleasing to her, she would then be in a good mood. I would then feel loved by her because she was in a good mood. So I learned very early on in my life that the more I do for others, the more that I would feel happy. But what I did not learn is those were the early signs and indicators of me being codependent and needing to need other people's validation in order to know my self-worth. Or I needed to be validated. I needed a compliment. I needed to know that I was doing a good job. I needed to hear from someone how good of a person I was in order for me to believe it. So my codependency, which is an addiction, started way before and developed way before I started using mind and mood altering substances at the age of 17 or 18. My behaviors through the years prior to my using, as I mentioned, being center of attention, being a people pleaser, 
I also became very controlling because as a result, I wanted to do everything for everyone. I wanted to take charge. I wanted to help everyone. I wanted to fix everyone. I wanted to help solve every problem that everybody had. Because if everybody could just be happy, then I would be happy too. And this was a vicious cycle that I operated from mentally for a very long time. That was my perception of things as a result of my childhood experiences. And then around the age of 17 or 18, when I met my first boyfriend, we developed a trauma bond. Something that I didn't know was a thing. That's how we connected. He also came from an environment of abuse and neglect and abandonment. His parents were divorced when he was around 11 years old, and his father was not a healthy, positive influence in his life and was raised solely by his mother and his grandparents. And so we connected as a result of our trauma, and we bonded as a result of helping each other out. And it would just so happen that when we were dating during that time in our lives, We partied a lot, and when we partied, there was alcohol, there was marijuana, there was prescription pills. Now, I grew up hearing that drugs are bad and that you shouldn't do drugs, right? But I also had this perception and then this belief that alcohol, prescription pills, especially if given to you by a doctor, uh, marijuana, they're not as illicit and they're not as extreme as maybe cocaine or heroin or as fentanyl as some of our young people use today. And so in my mind, again, perception, I justified and rationalized that having a drink, smoking marijuana, or taking a few pills wasn't a big deal. I could manage it. I can control it. I could put it down. There was never any education or understanding of my dependency issues and how rooted they were, and that I was on this quest to find my happiness and to find my worth, and never knowing and realizing that if I explore something that brought me happiness, that I would do it again and again and again. So when I started using mind and mood altering substances by the time, like I said, around the age of 17 or 18, the first time that I ever used And the first substance that I ever used was marijuana. And like anyone else out there that's listening to me that I've ever used a substance, even if it's one time, we experience something called euphoria when we use, which is a burst of chemicals to the pleasure center of the brain, right within the amygdala, which is serotonin, dopamine, adrenaline, norepinephrine, GABA, and opioid. These are seven chemicals that our brain produces naturally within the pleasure center of the brain, which makes us feel happy. That's why when we work, when we eat, when we have sex, we we do something that brings us pleasure. It ignites that part of the brain. And so when we are not happy and we want to feel happy and we found something that makes us happy, we will continue to do it in order to continue to experience that euphoric feeling. And what happens over time, whether it's with food or sex or drugs or alcohol or codependent relationships, we will continue to do the same thing over and over, expecting the same result we got the very first time that we have tried it. And so now our dependency issues have now progressed. And so now we're moving into that stage of where we need this for survival. We need this to be happy. Whatever this might be, I will give you the opportunity to fill in the blank because it's not just drugs and alcohol. And keep in mind, and I talk about this all the time when people go to treatment, when they come out of treatment, the journey has just begun. Going to treatment allows us the opportunity to ensure that we are safely withdrawing physically from the symptoms that we experience as a result of using mind and mood altering substances. We want to make sure that someone doesn't have a seizure or a heart attack, etc. And we're helping them abstain from mind and mood altering substances 
we're ensuring that they're not continuing to have the physical dependency of the issue. But once treatment is over, everything that I just mentioned that I experienced in the first 17 years of my life, the individual has to now begin a journey of recovery where they're learning to treat mind, body, and spirit. They have to take a look at their life experiences as far back as they can recall of what they've experienced, how it impacted them, what they believe to be true, what are the negative beliefs, what is the internal dialogue, what are the things we've been telling ourselves that are not true, but we believe them to be true, what emotions are we holding on to that we are harboring that has driven these maladaptive and unhealthy behaviors, whether you're rebellious, whether you're using substances, whether you're using food for comfort, if you're finding yourself constantly in toxic relationships or codependent relationships, if you isolate a lot, if you're shy, if you're more of an introvert or too much of an extrovert, right? When we look at behaviors, it's very important for us to ask ourselves, what is driving me to behave in this manner? Because our behaviors and our attitudes are learned. Behaviors and attitudes are not something that we as human beings are born with. We learn it from our environment. We learn it as a result of experiences that we've endured. So I just encourage everyone today, as you listen to this podcast, that you take a step back and ask yourself, some of the unhealthy behaviors, and we all have them, where do they come from? Why am I a controller? Why am I a problem solver? Why am I a fixer? Why am I a people pleaser? Why is it that I'm always doing for everyone else and putting everyone else first and I leave me behind? Now, that's just the environmental contributing factors that I just talked about. And I could talk about that for hours, but I know that we're running out of time. So the last part that I wanted to talk about was the spiritual aspect of this. And I'm not speaking on religion. I'm not trying to convert anyone. What you believe you have a right to believe. Spiritually, what I'm speaking on and also has an impact on the issues that we struggle with in life has a lot to do with what we, again, what we believe to be true. So I ask you today, who or what is your higher power? Do you believe that there is something or someone that is greater than you that can restore the insanity that's in our mind or the insanity that occurs in your life? For many people, they may answer this question and says, well, I'm in control of my life. I'm independent. I'm self-sufficient. I make my own rules. I solve all my problems. And if you do that, while that may be great for you, my question for you is, what happens when the day comes and you're enduring something in life and you cannot figure it out? You have a problem that you can't solve. Where do you go? Who do you turn to? How do you resolve those issues if you don't have the answer or you don't have the healthy coping skills? Now, there are others that may answer, well, I turn to God. And I'm a believer. I'm a believer through and through. And I do believe in God. I wasn't always that way in early recovery. I struggled um, with understanding who God was getting to know God and having a relationship with God. But I can tell you after 12 years on this journey in recovery and being free from mind and mood altering substances and being free from depression and anxiety, codependent relationships and toxic relationships, I give all of the praise and all of the glory to the God of my understanding. As a result of God, I am free from all of those addictions and dependency issues today because I got to a point in my life when I was no longer able to control people, places, and things. I was no longer able to fix every problem. My enabling was compromising my own health and the health of other people and compromising our relationships. And 12 years ago, I was brought to my knees for multiple reasons and life being stripped away from me. I had lost my children as a result of an affair, um, a divorce. I had lost my home. 
I was no longer working, and I lost everything that I had built within a 13-year period. I had, was married with two kids, house, dog, the white picket fence. But as a result of my dependency issues, struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety, struggling with the use of mind and mood-altering substances, through those years, I thought I was in control. I held the key to my kingdom. I was the one that was in charge until I wasn't in charge anymore. And when I lost it all, because I had solely relied on me, I had no one to turn to. But because God is so good during that time in my life, God placed very important people that he knew that I loved and adored and respected in my path so that those individuals could speak to me and pray for me and open a door where I can begin a journey to seek God. And I will never forget that time in my life and forget the experience that has brought me through this recovery journey in the last 12 years and that I will continue to stay on this journey and I will continue to walk alongside God because everything that I have today including my livelihood, is all praise to God. Believing that there was a power greater than me that can restore me to sanity gave me hope. Gave me hope in knowing that I could live another day, that I had purpose, and that although I didn't have a husband, I didn't have a house, I didn't have a job, I didn't have my children, all the things in which I defined myself by, when those things were taken away, like Job, I was left with just myself and having to almost relearn or discover who I, Natasha, really was. And I do believe today that all those things were stripped of me because God wanted me to begin a journey with him so I can discover who I was, discover my worth, discover my purpose based on what he says I am or who he says I am and not who I say that I am. Meaning that I thought I was a mother and a wife and a daughter and a friend and a good coworker. And I defined myself by the roles in which I carried or developed throughout my life. When those roles were taken from me, I no longer knew who I was. I had lost my identity. I didn't know my purpose. And as a result, I attempted to take my life. But God had other plans. And my favorite scripture is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you to give you hope, and to give you a future. And that God has certainly did for me in the last 12 years. I encourage you today, as you've listened to this podcast, to ask yourself, who or what do you believe in? Our mindset is everything. And if we believe in the negative, we're going to manifest negativity. If we believe in the positive, we will manifest positivity. And if you believe in God, if you believe in a higher power, and you believe in what he can do for you and how he can restore you, and he being the almighty God, and he's the one that is in true control, then it gives us the hope and it gives us the power to surrender our will to surrender our need for controlling people, places, and things and allow God of your understanding to step in and be in control of your life, your path, and your destiny. I hope that you enjoyed today's podcast. I hope I was able to provide you with some education, some life experience to help you understand that addiction is a comorbid illness and there's so many moving parts that contribute to this illness. And I encourage 
anyone out there listening today, don't get hung up on the word that it's a disease, but more that it's a dis-ease of our minds. And then at the end of the day, addiction is a result of emotional disconnection. So if we want to not be addicted to someone or something, we have to learn on how to emotionally reconnect or emotionally connect in a healthy way so that we can have a healthy relationship with ourselves, a healthy relationship with our higher power, and a healthy relationship with the people that we love. So I thank you all for joining me today. And I look forward to speaking with you guys in my next episode. And I ask you guys to stay tuned. Who knows what I'm going to be talking about next? It could be about boundaries. It could be more on codependency and how codependent relationships start and what the issues are at the root of it. So I just ask that you continue to join me week after week because I can guarantee you, you're going to get a lot of education. You're going to get a lot of experience. You're going to get a lot of love. You're going to get a lot of support. And if anything that you hear on today's podcast or in podcast recordings in the future, please feel free to reach out to me at empoweredvoices45 at gmail.com. Again, that's empoweredvoices45 at gmail.com. I look forward to speaking with you guys soon. Have a blessed day.